Hey guys, brand new podcast. Ignore this. Ignore this right here. That's driving Halston nuts right in there. But I feel like it's the Lord sitting on my shoulder telling me I'm going to do good things. More touring coming. I will announce when we have it. Things locked down. Uh, more driving movie theaters to come. I'm super excited. I had a blast in this last tour. Hit up my managers and agents and said, let's do some more. While this COVID thing is going out, I know I can stay safe in the bus, uh, isolated, zero contact, roll into these drive-ins, do the show, zero contact roll out. I think if I can do it safe, why not do more of them? You guys can be safe. You can stay in your car. You can isolate around your car. I absolutely had a blast on the hot summer nights tour. So why not do more? And so we have those lined up. And as soon as I get everything locked down, I will let you know. Uh, yeah. So that's it. That's it. Let's just do a podcast today. I think that's it, right? I have nothing else to promote. Go to burperbert.com for merch. My, I am like stumbling on words. I've been breathing through my nose a lot lately a lot because I listened to this Rogan podcast and now I'm breathing this morning. I was breathing two seconds, two breaths per term per minute. Does that sound like a, not a lot? That's not enough. I was doing two breaths per minute and then I held my breath for an, a minute and 37 seconds. By the way, I was laying in bed. I was doing two breaths per minute and it was fucking, it was like, it was crazy. I, listen to the Rogan's. I, I bought the guy's book, breathe the art of what you healing yourself. By the way, I've been breathing, and now I'm, I feel like my lungs feel fucked up, so I feel like I've been really focusing on my breath. I've also got mouth tape, because so I'm going to tape my fucking mouth and try sleeping with my mouth taped. Yeah, I'm fucking next level, Halston. I'm, I'm, I'm a lifestyle brand. Um, it's really interesting. I, they're saying six breaths per minute. And by the way, you can listen to Rogan's podcast. You, you'll, all the information you need is there. I am paraphrasing and not that well, mind you. They said six breaths per minute. And what I was doing was, initially, I was doing four breaths per minute and then i was like i wonder if i can do two breaths per minute and then i was like wait i can hold my breath for fucking a minute right and then i did it for a minute 37 and i was like oh shit um and then i got really focused on breathing and then i couldn't fall asleep because i was like i want trying to breathe through my nose and so apparently when i fall asleep the first thing i do is i go I don't know. So we're going to see if we can cut that out tonight. Anyway, today's podcast is a great fucking podcast. We've got some mid-roll reads, nothing up front. So let's just get to the podcast. Uh, 25 years ago, I met this man. He did not remember me for 25 years. I've met him a few times, but that's inconsequential, guys. This is a grown-up who's had a, uh, a thriving career in entertainment since I met him. When I met him, he was on my favorite sketch show it was the state the state was on mtv i found it when i was in college i absolutely fell in love with it we used to quote the state to each other i remember going to spring break the 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 spring break that my parents were getting divorced and i would do the we were i was with a bunch of girls driving down to key west and i just quoted the state the whole time and we were howling laughing this defined a lot of my sense of humor although you don't see it in my act the silliness of the, of the state the giggliness of that show was was just what I absolutely was in love with. I loved, I, I discovered giggling. And then I ran into him in Greece. Uh, when I was 22, I, I backpacked through Europe. Uh, I was, obviously I went to Russia and then I backpacked through Europe and I ran into him in Greece and I decided, I was telling my wife this last night, I decided I wanted to get into comedy after talking to him. I was very funny. Uh, I've always been fairly funny. And I said to him, I think I want to be a comedian. And he, and I, you know what I said? It was, I said, he was really cool. That he was like, just do it. Just move to New York and do it. You know, what's so funny is that I've said that to millions of people. I don't think there's ever a person that tells you not to get into comedy. If you love comedy, you're like, do it, fucking do it. You never know what is going to happen. If he had been a dick, I may have been like, yeah, that does seem like too hard of a challenge, but he wasn't a dick. He was a nice guy. We hung out in Greece. We talked, we got plates broken over our heads together. He told me to get a notebook and write down anything that I found funny, anything that made people laugh, anything that I found silly, write it down. And I started doing that then. And I continued doing that. And when I first did stand up, I had a notebook of things that I found funny. And, uh, and I didn't use any of it. I just went up and talked for half an hour. But when I moved to New York, I re-implemented that. And I still, to this day, oh, fuck. I have notebooks all over the place. I literally have notebooks everywhere. Blue's my power color. I'm going through a blue phase right now. And I still write down things funny. I put them on my phone and I write them down in books. If this guy had been a dick, I don't know if I would have gotten into comedy. If he made it seem like it was inaccessible, um, I, I maybe I wouldn't have done it, done it because he gave me his phone number uh, and he said, here's my phone number. Write it down. And when you get to New York, call me. I'll help you out however I can. 
Uh, I got to New York. Uh, three years after that, four, three years after that, I moved to New York. And the first person I called was David Wayne. The very first person I called was David Wayne. When I got to New York, the very first person I called was David Wayne. And he said, I got a comedy show tonight. Why don't you come down and hang out? I'll introduce you to some people. You can see stand up in New York. And he invited me down. I think we talk about this on the podcast to Stella and, uh, which was him. And, and I think it was Stella and it was him, Michael, uh, I want to say Michael Ian Black and Michael Showalter. And, uh, and I saw Janine Garofalo. I saw, I think Jeff Raw. I saw a lot of people there that I guess, I don't know if they're my contemporaries now. I still think they're way above me, but a bunch of people that were working standups. And that was the first comedy show I ever went to in New York because of this man. He gave me his phone number. How fucking cool. And I've been a fan of his. I've been a fan of him and all his friends. I love all of the guys from the state. I think they're all fucking phenomenal. But um, I've been a fan of his because of his kindness uh, for 25 years now. And I've watched him blossom as a director. Uh, He did Wet Hot American Summer, which I saw in a movie theater with Gary Valentine. And we fucking howled laughing. he did role models with, uh, I think, Sean Michael Scott, whatever his name is. You know that guy? You know what I'm talking about? Stifler. Yeah, yeah. We did, yeah, Stifler. He, started, he did role models. He's done a bunch of things. I, I've enjoyed I've enjoyed all of his work. I enjoy his sense of humor. I watched Stella on Comedy Central. What's even crazier is that he worked with one of my best friends in the world, Tony Hernandez. They worked together on Wet Hot American Summer. And now he's working again with Tony. I think Tony's producing... His Netflix series, World Police, is it World Police? Is it World Police, Halston? No, Medical Police. Medical Police, Medical Police. Medical Police uh, is on Netflix. I watched a couple episodes. It is, (laughs) if I'm not mistaken, it's about a pandemic, and it came out right before the pandemic. What perfect timing. I hope to work with him one day in in my career uh, because I absolutely think he's fucking awesome i really do i've run into him a million times i've every time i say the same thing i'm the guy that met you in greece and he goes oh we played volleyball together and i go wrong guy and i think we actually happens on this podcast where i go i'm the guy it doesn't matter he cannot remember who i am for as long as he fucking wants i absolutely love this dude if it wasn't for his kindness i don't know that i'd be here today i'm being serious that's a crazy you know those sliding doors one guy's an asshole to you and then you're like fuck new york but one guy's nice to you Gives him his phone, gives him your phone number, and you get to New York. You call him, and he invites you out to the show, and and the path is that much easier. If you learn anything from today's lesson, is be an awesome fucking dude like this man, ladies and gentlemen. Today's guest on the Birdcast, actor, director, uh, former member of oh, still member of the state, but former uh, cast member of the MTV show The State, David Wayne. He's the man. It is so good to see you. Uh, I'll start this off with a, a little preamble. You are probably the reason uh, I'm in comedy. You know that, right? Come on. No, come on. You know no, that. Come on. I do this to you. I've done this to you. I've maybe known nothing, nothing of this. You're, I'm, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to start this and you're going to go, oh, God, I know who the fuck you are. I met you in Greece about 22 years ago. When you were with the state. Oh my God. Yep. This is and crazy. No, but I've, I've known you and followed you in your current career and didn't actually really connect it. David, that's I, crazy. I, ran, I'm, I mean, obviously, I think everyone that's in comedy these days, I, I believe everyone I respect was a massive fan of the state. And uh, kind of re, I, and I want to talk to you about that. I want to talk to you about the way you kind of, uh, insightfully showed everyone you guys collectively but i know that you know you you and stella kind of showed everyone a different way to look at the joke but yeah i ran into you uh joe latrulio uh i think thomas lennon was oh, there. i remember this incredibly well uh yeah and i remember and being in touch with you afterwards uh, you gave me your phone crazy. number you, you were, yeah we were on a beach vacation with the state it was the first time that we did anything like traveled in our lives because we were like 26 years old. We had just been in the middle of doing our show, the state on MTV. 
And me and Tom Lennon and Joe Latrulio and a bunch of us were on a trip to Greece and we ran into this weirdo on the beach and that was you. And then <laughs> I was, you kind of like followed us around a little bit. Followed you everywhere. I remember, I remember uh, grabbing you and saying one night we were uh, partying at the bar and I said, they were getting ready to do the plate ceremony where the guy came out with the plates and you smashed them over your heads. And I said, oh, you got to see this. This is amazing. Yeah, I yeah. Really close, and you had a notebook and you were writing things down in a notebook. And I was like, wait, what are you doing? And you're like, if you're a comic, you got to write everything down. You got to write everything down. Anytime you have an idea, oh write it down. God. By the way, by the way, I'm, I'm sitting right now next to like 20 notebooks. That was the first time I ever heard of that. <laughs> and uh, I, that night I ended up drunk in the beach and I said, um, I think I, think I want to get into this. I really think I want to do stand up and I ran into you the next day and I said I said to you I, I, I want to do stand up and you said all right move to New York start doing stand up I'll give you my phone number you gave me your phone number anytime I run into anyone from the state we all re recite that old phone number you had I won't say it now but uh and uh that's like proof flex that you, man. Two, one, two, one, two one two flex man <laughs> yeah that was my number for years and I when I moved I so then to give you a backstory, I, Rolling Stone art magazine wrote an article about me calling me the number one party animal in the country. I moved to New York, and my first night in New York, I called you, and you said, I'm doing a show called Stella. Janine will be here. Why don't you come down? You'll be my guest. Come down and see some stand-up. If you've never done it, really, I'd done it once. You said, see some stand-up. And that first show was my introduction into stand-up comedy. That was the first like live show I saw. And it, I mean, obviously, I think I went on a, sim a different path, but that that style of comedy that even the state dictates to this day, the way I see jokes to, to this day, it, uh, it doesn't need to be structured. It just needs to be funny. It needs to make you giggle. It doesn't have to have a set up punch. It can just be baloney feet. And then all of a sudden you're like, what baloney feet, <laughs> you know, like. I, I am genuinely, I want to make a joke, but I can't because I'm genuinely sort of blown away and moved by this, like that, that, that's that where you started and it came all the way through that and that I'm dumb enough to know you now and seeing your Netflix show and other things and forget that those two people are the same person. <laughs> One of my best friends growing up that's worked, wild. worked with you on Wet Hot American Summer, uh, Tony Hernandez. Who's that? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Tony Hernandez is one of well, my- I, I work with Tony now. Yeah, so do I. Uh, he'd produce both my specials, and uh, we're doing a sitcom. Wow. And I grew up with He Tony. was my assistant. He was the I assistant know. to the director let's, on Wet American Summer. Let's start, let's start with Wet American Summer, of, Summer, because that seemed like the funnest movie to shoot. Uh, tell everyone, if you can, just the, just the from I'm, I'm talking nuts and bolts to like the filming, where you guys were, who you guys were at the time. I would credit you with discovering Paul Rudd, and then... Just all of it. I would love to hear everything about Wet Hot American Summer. Well, basically, we were, had done, been doing that show, The State, on MTV, and Michael Showalter, who's another guy in that group, and I wanted to try to... The, that, had been, that whole enterprise was falling apart, and we were trying to figure out what do we do, and we tried to come up with some ideas for movies, and everything seemed too hard and too complicated and wouldn't get done fast enough, so we decided... Let's shoot something that we can shoot like outside that takes place in the daytime where we wouldn't have lights and we can just get our friends to do it. And, and we're like, summer camp seems to make sense. And we, we decided we were inspired by Sam Cedar's movie pilot season he had done where he had just had a 30 page outline and ran around the town and got his friends to improvise scenes. And we thought, well, that's what we'll do. We'll go to Central Park and we'll just like make a camp movie. Um, and we started writing it out and we realized as we wrote it out, oh, it's really becoming more of a whole screenplay. And we wrote this script and then we got, we took it around trying to get financing for it and got no's for three years from everyone or almost yeses and then no's. Finally, three years later, we got a tiny budget and we went to this summer camp in uh, Pennsylvania uh, with a bunch of all, including ourselves, largely first timers. Um, we did cast Elizabeth Banks in her first role, Bradley Cooper in his first job. Um, and, uh, Paul Rudd was somebody who'd been in some movies, uh, that we had met and asked him to, to do it. And, um, Janine Garofalo. And it was, it was definitely a convergence of an incredible group of people and a lot of luck. We had very little money shooting on film, one or two takes per thing. It rained every single day. Uh, and, um, somehow, this very special 
thing came out of it. Not, I mean, and we, you know, we worked really hard on it, but then we took it to Sundance and, um, seemed to, people seemed to love it, but nobody bought it. And, uh, we ended up months later getting this bottom feeding deal, uh, from USA films now defunct. Uh, and it, you know, it bombed in theaters, but then sometime after that, it started to gather traction as a, as a cult film. Yeah. It was, was it, was it fun to shoot or was it stressful? Uh, it was both. I mean, for me, it was exciting. It was my first time really shooting with a real, I, I had done a lot of mo most of the directing I had done before was me holding the camera with my friends and being like, Hey, stand over there, try this, try, you know, and I hadn't done a lot of work, if any, with a proper crew with a, you know, first AD and the director and like really understanding how to do all that stuff. Um, so I was nervous on that level and it was stressful because it was the dealing with the rain involved. It was my first big, big experience as a director learning how to improvise when things come your way um, and this whole cast. Um, but it was also a total blast because we were a bunch of kids kind of in a candy store out in the middle of the woods, living together in the bunks, eating the camp food. It was like returning to camp and uh, also being adults at the same time. It was pretty, it was a very, very special experience. How, what was it like for you? I, I feel like you're someone who has always had kind of a grip on the business. Like, like I, I, I don't know why. I feel like even with everyone in the state, and well, I want to talk about the state in a little bit, but with everyone in the state, you and Thomas Lennon seem like the two guys who kind of walked in ready to run. E e even when I would say like, you know, obviously Showalter has this like real kind of flighty poet side to him, I always feel like. But you and Thomas Lennon seem like two guys <laughs> right. that just were like, hey, introduce to us to an exec. Let's pitch a movie. Let's sell this. Hey, we need to get distributing. We need to get like how much of that, that stereotype of you is accurate? I think it's it, everyone was in that group. It was 11 of us. We all had, did, took turns having a mix of different versions of what you're saying. And I think that, yeah, I definitely gravitated towards nuts and bolts leadership and getting stuff done in that way. Uh, I mean, that is true. And I guess Tom was uh, definitely in that world too. I mean, just yet yeah, people, when a group is that big, even though we all, nobody had a different title or a different job or hierarchy, but people gravitated towards like, oh, I'm going to handle this side of things because it's just what naturally happens and helped us learn more about ourselves. But yeah, um, I've always tried to be a self-starter and, you know, be like, why not? Let's do it. Let's go. Let's go. You know, let's not wait around. Um, and now we're in quarantine. <laughs> so when you, so when you, um, so when you were going through the process of it, showing it at Sundance, you said, and, and everyone loving it, and then having a hard time yeah. getting getting distribution or someone to get behind it. How, I know what it's like. I think everyone on my side of the business or our side of the business, everyone on our side of the business knows what it's like to fail, but it's different to know what it's like for other people to fail. Like whenever I hear of someone I look at as like someone doing things right all the time to hear, I'm curious to know what it was like for you to struggle with that movie where you're like, I killed it. I have an amazing fucking cast. It's a hilarious summer comedy. This is a, an homage to all the seventies films that everyone loved, like meatballs. This is fucking hilarious. What, like, what's it like for you to be frustrated? I feel like more often than not, the rule in my career has been, I've struggled hard to make something that I really love. It came out in a way that I'm really happy with people who see it, love it, but it bombs. That happened with Wet Hot American Summer and a lot of things I've done. And I'm okay with it because I've survived. Um, but uh, that's, that's exactly the feeling you get. Like, I, I know Wet Hot American Summer is great for me, you know, and for the people who love it. Um, and the audience is at Sundance, starting at Sundance, went nuts for it. But we didn't even get one even, you know, random offer to distribute. And all the way up to Medical Police today on, on Netflix, where I feel like we made this incredible show that the critics and the fans went nuts for, but it didn't seem to like become a big thing. So it might just be a certain style of comedy. Stella had a similar reaction. Uh, our movie, they came together. Certain things, uh, it, there's a certain slice to the comedy, I think, that we sometimes do, where the larger audience gets a little 
confused by it or turned off by it. And that, but, but it's that same very thing that makes the audience that likes it become obsessed with it. Yeah. It's, I mean, I say this respectfully, but I remember showing the state to people in college and I remember girls I wanted to have sex with not getting it at all and starting conversations over it to other people and me no longer finding them attractive. Interesting. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite things I hear is that movies like Wet Hot or whatever are the litmus test that people have for whether they can be friends with people or whether they can date people. <laughs> Me and Gary Valentine. Do you, do you know Gary Valentine? I don't. Gary Valentine. I'd like to know him. Yeah, he's great. His Kevin James is brother. Kevin James and Gary Valentine are brothers. They did the same. They took different stage names when they got into the business. Me and Gary Valentine went and watched Wet Hot American Summer together uh, in, in Brentwood. And we were crying laughing. And I, I say that we were maybe two of 15 people in the movie theater. And the enti- it was right, so right. cool to be in a group of 15 people who were crying <laughs> laughing. And we were, it, was like, it was almost like going like finding a cool sushi restaurant that doesn't have any advertising that you fall in love with. And right. you're like, no, you got it. This place, you can't order off the menu. The chef just makes it. It's, but it's so good. It's not for everyone, but God, it's so fucking good. I remember having that experience going to see Pootie Tang. <laughs> which is, uh, remember that movie? Of course, was, yeah. Like, oh my God. I, I, I was in a theater with 15 people and, we're, and I'm like, this is incredible. Where is everybody? <laughs> <laughs> what is it about, I, I've, I've said this so many times, only because I don't think people uh, that don't make movies including comics, including actors, including anyone. People that don't make movies have no idea how difficult it is to write something on a paper and then shoot it and make that same idea just as funny on screen as it was when you had the idea. How difficult is is that? And how do you go about that? That's a great question, I think. And that's the big trick, I think, especially if you're doing a feature film where you might conceive of and first laughed at a joke years before it gets completed. And so to me, that's actually the test of a joke is, am I actually still genuinely laughing at it in the final color correct when I've watched that joke thousands of times um, after going through all the process? And I think the director's main job in the whole thing is having that judgment to protect or understand okay, you know, this was funny when we wrote it, but now it's not working on screen the right way. So let's adjust, you know, or in the edit room or in the table read or in the prep or at any point along the way. And, and also it's, you know, 80% editing, I think, you know, by the time, you know, a joke can be funny, but it's not funny when you add a certain kind of music or when you move the reaction shot three frames later, or when you put it, and after this other scene, or, you know, there's so many hundreds of factors that affect what makes something work, whether it's, whether it's that it's funny or that it's dramatic or that it helps propel the story or whatever. Do you remember your first, do you remember your first idea written on paper, taken it onto screen, shot it, positive response where you're like, God, that, that killed in the room and it killed on the screen. Um, well, I would say, I mean, just, it doesn't need to be a whole, I feel like, the, yeah, I mean, I feel like the, um, th- that, that has been sort of the, the drug of making these things from yeah. early on. I remember my student, this 20 minute film, aisle six, you can watch online. Uh, there were jokes, um, that, uh, just dumb jokes. Like I remember the Joe Latrulio saying about the main character of the movie, like, you know, we used to like him a lot, but now we know he's a fucking dick or it's just some stupid line. And I was like, I laughed in the, in the script and then we shot it. We were laughing. And then it goes up on screen at a film festival and everyone's laughing too. And I'm like, wow, that's so cool. Like we made it, we made it across the gauntlet. Um, and I think that's, that happens with every project. You know, there's, there's those things that, you hoped were funny from beginning to the end. And then, and then there's a lot of times though, 
it's like the number one joke in the script that everyone's like, that's why I bought your script or that's why I'm excited to make this. And we're like, I can't wait to shoot that scene and then get all that through. And then you get to the edit room and you're like, hmm, looks like we're cutting that. You know, looks like that whole scene's going because just didn't quite translate, you know, or whatever we were in love with before isn't any longer relevant. And it's fun. I think that's part of the exciting puzzle is to like be the one to step backwards, look at the hole and be like, yeah, we used to love that. And, or especially in editing, uh, I, it's that thing of like, boy, that was, we put a lot of money and time into the, that scene. And you have to be like, that doesn't matter anymore. Just what, 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 what's up, what's on the screen right now. What made you laugh when you were younger? Like what was the, what was the first time you remember laughing with friends, not necessarily with parents, but like back of the bus, back of the classroom, you know, up late at night. What was it? What made you laugh really hard when you were younger? I mean, I, I loved listening to Steve Martin records. That was like my, my God at the time. And, and, his, and we used to tape his specials on Betamax, his NBC specials. And I watched them over and over and over again to the point where I just internalized and all that stuff went into my bones. And also all the old Woody Allen movies um, I was just always cracking up about. And then, yeah, and I guess me and my friends just started internalizing some of that same stuff together and making similar jokes together, just like weird anti-humor, I guess. I don't know. Um, but I'm still, I still hang out with a lot of those same kids. I was in the back of the bus with when I was four um, mm-hmm. and we worked together. Uh, and so it's pretty, it's a pretty cool continuum. Craig yeah. Wedren, the, the guy who's done the uh, music for basically everything I've ever done uh, has been my friend since we were in nursery camp. Really? Did um? Yeah. Did did you guys? Um, I I apologize that I put a bunch of ideals and things that I think about you or I've thought about you and and your friends out there and go and then I'm I've always had these thoughts and then I put them on you and you're like I don't know man but how much <laughs> did, how much did music affect you guys had such a punk vibe were you like into like the Susie and the Banshees and the Swiss I mean like f- watching you guys I felt like going. Oh, I know who these guys are. Oh, these are the guys. Oh, I know these guys. And it's like, I knew who you guys were when you were seniors at my high school when I was a freshman. It's, it's, it sounds silly. Right, right. But I, I, I figured out who you guys were without ever. And then I, met, I met, remember meeting Michael uh, Ian Black and going, oh, he was not that guy at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to, to some degree, yeah. The, uh, Michael Ian Black's a great uh, example of someone who, Show, sort of created a persona that is nothing like his real life uh, yeah. on screen, whereas others of us were just a little more real who we were. But um, the rock and roll thing was always pretty intentional. We, we, as a group in college, we felt like we'd rather think of ourselves as like as a badass rock band than as a comedy troupe. And we performed in rock clubs, not in comedy clubs. And we just, you know, uh, everyone was always out drinking and like, so just, we just wanted to, we felt like rebel rock band. That's, that's how we wanted to feel. And we were really cocky and we were like, we're the best from take over the world. And then we were sort of lucky enough to end up at MTV, which was a music network. So our first big thing out was we were, had the freedom at the time uh, to use any music from the MTV library in our sketches, which is of course could never happen today. Um, and so it made our, and and they wanted us to at the time it was like you know infuse the MTV music and and uh, vibe into all the comedy so it, it added to that rock and roll thing but of course I mean I've always been a frustrated musician uh, right now I'm making uh, cover songs on Instagram like every other day um, in, in my garage with other people collaboratively just for kicks um, really? left to my own devices and with nothing else to do that's what I do is I'm a frustrated rock rock star <laughs> i think we all are <laughs> the, the, what yeah, uh what it's like the cliche a uh, 50 year old white guy like in the garage like, come on i'm a, <laughs> but i don't i don't fucking care it sounds funny <laughs> it's there's people i feel like you've gotten more attractive the older you've gotten do you feel that way <laughs> oh yeah. No, but like you've always had like a like an old man look, and now that you're fifty, you don't look fifty; you look thirty seven. <laughs> well, I remember in my twenties, Tom Lennon would say to me, "Like, dude, you, you are going to come into your own like when you're fifty. 
And I was like, yeah. you know, it made sense at the time and it still does. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what's, what's your favorite sketch from the state and what's your least favorite one that people bring up? Oh, that's, well, my, I have a few favorites that I, you know, people ask me that a few times. And I mean, one that constantly comes to mind is the taco male sketch. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, oh my is, God. That the, ver- I apologize, yeah. the verbiage in that. Uh, yeah. I think yeah. we're saying a lot of things that we don't mean right now. I'll tell you what I'm hearing. I'm hearing, you yeah. know, tacos. That's actually not what I'm saying at all. That is such a great back and forth. Com- comedically, I must have watched that a million fucking times. It's so funny. I, I, I actually did a whole podcast uh, not too long ago um, called Good One, which was a deep dive just on that one sketch. Who was um, that with? I, I know Good One. I back- don't ask me that. Dude, I, I just, I, they just asked me, or I just saw them or something. I, I, it's about deep. A really I, great. It's from Vulture. Uh, it's the Good One podcast, and he goes with, in, with every time he goes with a, uh, it's Jesse David Fox, and he goes in and he talks to a comedian about one bit or one joke and goes really deep. It's really cool. It's one of the best um, sketches ever. It's made, it made me laugh so fucking hard. And what's crazy about that is like, you know, some of the very, very best sketches from the state era, especially, and in, and in any time, were the ones that just sort of spit out in the minute. Like, and, and certainly, I remember very clearly writing the taco sketch with Michael Black and Kevin Allison. We were sitting on a, the porch of a house that we were shooting a dip, another sketch in one day, and we were bored and just typing. And it was literally like just us typing just whatever came out and it was so dumb we're like how about this but it's true that in retrospect if you look at it it is kind of like a perfect little sketch that came and we went and shot it just the three of us with no crew just just literally went out on the street with the camera i mean it looks like that but it's uh it was it was it's that it came out to be one of my favorites as opposed to other ones that we did many many drafts on and it was a big production and the whole thing um, you know, I love the Porcupine Racetrack one, which we actually just did a whole 25 years later reunion of the whole group uh, online, uh, re- redoing that one. And um, there was there was a bunch that I loved. Um, and you asked me which one do people bring up to me a lot that I that I hate. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's I, they, the 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 better ones I think are the ones that people remember. There's definitely if you go back and watch the state episodes, like any sketch show there are the filler ones and the, the ones that just don't translate through the, through the era. But I am surprised when I've seen it, how much of it does hold up for me and does still feel funny. It's funny because I think good comedy, I think great comedy, I'll say great comedy is comedy. You, you be, that be that kind of slides into your DNA. And then that is something you say or hear when those situations arise, um, right. I had a, I had a great moment. I had a great moment with my daughters about, uh, one of my good friends is a comedian, but he's also a very famous or a very popular comedian, Joey Diaz. And he was on uh, TV and they were like, who is that? And my daughters didn't realize it was Joey. And it was that scene from I'm Doug dad. And, you probably don't even know who Bob Dylan is. You mean Uncle Robert? Like, and they right. said, they said on the, they said, oh, you mean Uncle Joey? And I went, oh my God, that's Uncle Rob. It was like a great little, and there's so many things about the state that, that have that in, I mean, was it difficult when you were kind of mocking what was media and art at the time with sketches like the Judy Italian and the redhead gay to then kind of go into those same networks like Fox. So I think you guys ended up at Fox with the state and then work hand in uh, hand with people yeah, that yeah. were, that you were kind of, you were the counterculture to what they were creating. And then they wanted to kind of take what was celebrable about you and then put it in their kind of meat grinder. Did you have a hard time with that at times? Yes. Uh, there was definitely a, 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 a weird transition moment where, especially after Wet Hot American Summer came out, you know, we had this movie, even though it wasn't a hit, it was a Sundance movie. And so Michael Schalter and I came to LA 
And there were people in the business who were fans of the movie. Uh, and they were like, you know, we love this movie. Now can you come and do something that is nothing like that? You know, like, we love what you guys do. Now can you throw away everything you do and try to do something that's, you know, they, they would take the external parts of it. And so I got sent after Wet Hot and, and even after uh, Role Models, a, a lot of like puke sex comedies that, that were kind of, to me, exactly what we were making fun of. Um, yeah. And it was hard for me to get my head around that. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, I feel like if they were good, then I would be super psyched. Like, I, I don't feel like I need to be in any box. I just want to do something that speaks to me in any truth. Um, so that, that, but it is, it was weird at, at, at points and people don't, you know, I did want to tell you though, that when you mentioned the Bob Dylan thing, there's a little story about that, which is when the state was first starting out, we had all these directives from MTV to make sure that they were like, make thing, make things that are spoofing MTV or that are pop culture related or whatever. And trying to like make up ideas of what a sketch comedy show should be from people who had no clue. We, in retrospect, those executives themselves were in their twenties and had no idea. Nobody had any idea. Yeah. But um, we wrote this sketch about Bob Dylan, I think on 90210 or something. And they said, you, we, we won't let you shoot this sketch because no one's ever heard of Bob Dylan. And we were just like, what? And uh, so in the first season of, of the MTV show, there's a some Bob Dylan reference in every sketch um, <laughs> somewhere hidden in, whether it's an, on a prop or just a throwaway line or something. <laughs> but, our little, we did a lot of things that were kind of like, fuck you to the, to the man, you know? Yeah. What was, uh, so role models, I, role models seem like a studio film that they brought you in. I, I, but it, did you guys create role models? Did you create it? No. Oh. Uh, role models was a setup um, at, at Universal with and Paul Rudd and Sean William Scott were attached, uh, and it was close to shooting. It was a couple of months away from shooting, and they had gone through a million writers uh, had come and done different versions of the script, and nobody was happy. The director eventually left, and they were stuck. and But they had a crew, and uh, and they were in prep, and they were like, "What what are we going to do?" So they called me and I had only done um, two movies that were indies that when wet hot American summer and the 10 and they were like, all right, you're a person. Let's what, you know, let's try something. And so I was like, man, this, this movie, like, what are we going to do here? And so we um, Paul Rudd and, and Ken Marino and I sat in a room and pretty much rewrote the thing from scratch and kind of, and put our own voice into it and, rebuilt the story and added characters and made it into, you know, we, we used the, the bones uh, that were there, which with the basic bones of the story we thought were good, but a lot of what um, gave it the particular personality and the comedy that we wanted to do was not there. So at the last minute while prepping, we built this movie kind of from scratch. It was so fucking um, good. And, uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, I loved it too and it, and we also had a writer's strike right in the middle and so it was like we weren't done with the script and we had to s stop writing and it was a very weird process but really fun and then to me i'm most proud that we did take what is a studio buddy mainstream comedy and then still layer in our voice kind of on the second layer so the writer's strike broke right when you right when you went to start filming yeah, during filming. And we were, it was the kind of comedy where we would be writing throughout the whole filming anyway, but e even more so because we had no time to really finish the script. Wow. That was such a good movie. It was fun when you, when you love a movie and then you see, like when I saw your name on it, I went, oh, no wonder I fucking liked it. It's like, <laughs> like uh, I, I had ribs one time in South Carolina and I was like, these are the best fucking ribs I've ever had. And the guy goes, yeah, I dip them in honey. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, I know shit. I like it. That and, made sense. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> just dipped in honey. I was, he was like, yeah, yeah, I just dipped the whole thing in honey. And then there, you eat it. And I was like, okay, yeah, honey always works for me. I think um, a lot of people saw role models or didn't see role models. They, they were like, it looks like just some random 
the, a different kind of movie maybe. And then they see it and they're like, oh my God, this is really funny in a, in a way that I didn't expect. I think people said, felt that way about Wanderlust as well. Cause Wanderlust was great. It, what, okay. The, the what, is it about, what is it about Paul Rudd? Like I can't figure out when I first saw him and the first time I saw him, I thought this is a guy whose uncle is an exec and got a job. Right. And then all of a sudden I see him again. Like that's how that's, he's got a, he's got a very, like every guy kind of look, I mean, not like overwhelming, not striking. And then all of a sudden, I mean, he turned 50 the other day and I was like, I think I tweeted, he's a goddamn American treasure. Everything. He has this draw you in ability. I saw him on the street in New York one time and I did a double take, but not because he was Paul Rudd, just because he has an air about him. What is it about Paul Rudd? Like, You've been on, on, you've acted with him and you've also been like on the other side of the camera. What is it? What has he got? Yeah, no, I, I got to tell you, I've done six movies with him. He's a very good friend of mine. And I still, I think it is a true mystery. I, 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 I've talked to him about it, but I don't, I think he's got that incredible thing that you want. Like he's, he's a movie star and he has this ability innately. And I'm sure he, I know he works hard too, but I know he's also born with this ability to be so funny and so uh, inviting you into his world and so charming uh, and so real and within the scene while also being aware of the technicalities and the jokes and the script and what needs to happen and where to do it. I mean, he's, he is truly a miraculous performer. I, I, I've never worked with anyone quite like him. And I had the same impression of him too. When I first started working with him, I was like, yeah, he seems fine. You know, like, you yeah. know, he's a guy, you know? <laughs> um, and then I just, it wasn't really until we were in the post on Wet Hot American Summer that I started to get a real appreciation for just how genius he is. Um, and he continues to, mar to, to blow me away. Every time I see him or work with him, I'm like, how does he do that? And it's funny, if you're in the edit room with him, I mean, with his with the material, each take he does something else that's helpful. You know, it's it's wild. Really? Do you yeah. find him? Do you find him doing cheats ever? Like, like I'm sure with some actors, you're like, like, uh, like I'm not going to do it. To, I'm such a big fan of everyone on the state. I could find their cheat, but as a comic, I could. Like, as a yeah. comic, I go, uh, oh my, I'll give you my cheat. Hey, Bert, let's let's deliver the line. How about you don't laugh after it to like. You know, like just deliver the line. You ever find him doing cheats? Uh, I mean, if you're talking about like sort of like go to tricks or yeah, like I would love yeah. to go back and watch some Paul Rudd movies and go, ah, there he goes again. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, you know, I think he'll he'll get. I found that he'll have little habits that I'll be like, oh, you don't need to do that. Or, you know, especially I think when he was doing a lot of um, movies that had a lot of improvised process, he was reaching for improvs sometimes when he didn't need to, cause the it's all there, you know, or, yeah. or, but he means he's the most uh, gifted improviser also I've ever seen on screen. Um, but basically no, the answer, the short answer is not really he, he seems to just to be in the pocket, like a drummer in the pocket most of the time. And, uh, also sometimes he's like, I always, I always remember working on Wanderlust when he w we were doing a super emotional scene between him and Jennifer Aniston out on this porch. Everyone's watching. There's rain falling. It's like a big thing, big monologues. And everyone in the scene is like kind of like script, trying to figure it out, make sure they're ready. And like, okay, here we go. He's playing words with friends on his phone. Like not, I'm like, Paul, we're rolling. It's like, what? Yeah. What, what's going on? You know, I'm like, let's go. Okay. Ready and action. He's like, all right, all right. And then he's then out if there he is just flawless, you know, like, yeah. so I don't know. Yeah. Right he, he's uh, there's a, there's a web series called hot ones mm -hmm. and uh, where you eat progressively hotter wings. And oh, I'm, yeah, I've seen that. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, I've been on it, but I'm a fan of the show as well. Yeah. Paul Rudd was on. And once again, I'm like, ah, I mean, Paul Rudd, man, I walked away going like this guy's fucking super special. Yeah. He really, I mean, like, I, I, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, well, I do, I do this uh, Instagram thing right now called C C A R S collaborative covers of amateur with amateurs of rock songs. And uh, I asked Paul to do one verse in um, walk this way that we were doing. And he did literally one verse and it was like one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Like <laughs> he just made it, just hit it just the right tone. <laughs>
Can you pick that out uh, as a director or as just as a fellow performer? Can you pick that star quality out when you see them, when you work with them? I think I can, but I don't think that's, that's a special, I mean, that's why they have it is because it's easy to see. Really? I, maybe, maybe I'm, maybe I'm underselling myself, but I feel like that's, you know, I remember doing a short in 1998 with Zach Galifianakis and just watching his way of being funny on camera and a little in with little things. I'm like, this guy, Jesus, you know, like I can never do that. It's, and I love, one of the things I love about being a director who I act sometimes, but I, I love being a director that can work with actors and just see them be so good at that and see them light up. And, you know, sometimes you're friends with an actor or you've been working with them in prep and you met them. And then when the camera actually rolls, you realize, Oh, this is why they, they're making a living doing this. Cause they, they really know something or they really have some tools that the average person doesn't. And I like, I love experiencing that. Yeah. Who was the, who, did, who was the kind of collective, like, Oh, this is going to be the breakout star from the state. And then like when you guys started, you were like, Oh, we'll, we'll have him for, two years and then he'll go on to do sitcoms and, and mm. then we'll just be together. Well, the different, it's funny, different of us at, the, at different moments, even in the earliest stages, like certainly Carrie was a standout cause she was the only woman. And beautiful. And, so, and beautiful. Uh, By the way, Carrie, and Carrie, Carrie, and Carrie to this, like when I, it's funny because you see someone like her on camera when you're in college, kind of in an impressionable age on TV and you go, wow, that's not the kind of girl I normally would go for. But now I'm attracted to a quirky, yeah. different go- girl with her own voice. Oh, yeah. She had it. She was definitely like God. hot to trot in that way. Like pe- people were blown away by her. Beautiful. I honestly. Yeah. Um, Ken Marino had had some sort of development deal through ABC, I think, early on during that time. And so he was, you know, had that as sort of a standout. Todd Hollebeck, who founded the group, had been in a commercial when we were still in college, I think. And so at one moment, he was like the guy that was going to be the guy, you know, and then you just never know, you know, it was, there's always been this friendly one-upmanship horse race between all 11 of us to see like, you know, who's, who's doing what. Um, Now I'm too tired. I don't care. (laughs) It's funny. I felt I, this is going to sound horrible, but uh, let me ask you, did you feel like Ken Marino turned his back on us when he did Guys Behaving Badly? <laughs> Maybe no. <laughs> I was so, I was like, don't, oh, come on, man, don't do that. Like, that, that's not us. That's not what we're about. Like, well, if it's, if it means uh, anything to you, he didn't, I did not enjoy that experience. <laughs> oh, good, 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 <laughs> good. No, but Ken Marino is not working uh, ever. Uh, Never. All of you guys, all of you guys have continued working and it's fun when I see you guys in a project like Joe Latrulio probably is the, probably the person that's sprinkled in the most throughout everything where you're like, ah, yeah. there he is. And you know, probably by the way, one of the nicest human beings when, when we met you guys in, um, in Greece, oh, yeah. you were, yeah. you were very generous in, with your time and your advice and whatnot. But Joe Latrulio up on the top deck after dinner, sat and talked to me, but like, it was almost like he was like really listening. I don't, I don't even do that. No, now. He's truly one of the gr- sweetest, nicest people you'll ever meet in any context. He's incredible. Yeah. And also, yeah, the most versatile, funny actor ever. Um, but uh, yeah. Great what guy. was it like? What was it like? You guys were all in one group, but you guys all had different projects that all seemed to take off in their own way. Like you guys had Stella as a live show, which was easily one of the most popular shows in New York city. That was your live show. And that was three of you. You Michael and show Walt, Michael show Walter, Michael and black and yourself. Right. And then, and then, uh, and then I guess Tom Lennon and Carrie Kenny and Ben Garant and, uh, and Michael black also were doing Viva variety. Right. After. I remember Viva variety. Um, and then, yeah, there were all different things. And Michael Jan at that, era this was in the late 90s right after the state started doing a lot of commercials and becoming very successful um ben garan and tom lennon became writing partners and started becoming very successful screenwriters in hollywood and everyone started doing their own stuff but then the group kind of we never 
you know, we never completely broke up and we still kept working together in different, different configurations all the way through the decades afterwards and still to today. Was it, was it, were there touch and go times with egos and with feelings when, uh, say they went off to do Viva Variety, which is probably, it sounded like the first project and then massively, the- no, it was a huge, it's a, there's actually a book that's uh, there. Someone did an oral history of the state, which you can actually buy. Um, and it, tells the story. There was a massive schism at that time. The people who did not do Viva Variety, the rest of the group were extremely pissed off um, because there was a feeling like we were still trying to figure out the next state thing. Um, But the truth is that that group of 11 was never going to stay together in that form for too long because it's just too many people that have, you know, seven, I think seven, eight or nine of us have already directed feature films by now. Like it's, it's, we were 11 big beasts and uh, the fact that we did stay together as long as we did was a a great gift. Yeah. What, uh, what was the, one of my favorite things I have to mention was state by state with the state. Yeah. yeah. That was a book we wrote, which was an uninformed, poorly researched guide to traveling the United States. It was laugh out loud, funny, to the day, to, I mean, I I will I could quote that, and I know you wouldn't remember any of it. But Big Dick Malone was oh, yeah. a game. Oh, li, uh, lick the seatbelts! Oh my God, I love that. I mean, I, I I've never met anyone who even had heard of it, much much less could quote it. That's awesome. Well, here's the thing: is you that buy I, that as an ebook right now? As an ebook, it it was it was fantastic, and and I think the style of comedy you were doing was so different. Uh, such its own thumbprint in just a way to look at humor as opposed to what was on comedy central at the time was like, which was like set up punch kind yeah. of a little, little s- static, not, not really like interesting. And for me and my friends who are those guys, like we are had, had people like yourself, I'll say Janine. I always think Janine's an influence on me, even though you couldn't see it in what we do. Um, had you guys not been around, I just would have, I maybe wouldn't have gotten into stand up, or maybe I would have, and I would just would have been like set up punch guy, which I don't yeah. technically do. And, but the, just the obscurity, like the obscure references, the little things that would make you giggle, then all of a sudden was like, that's what, that's what comedy is. You know, it's, it's really hard to. Well, sometimes the way we thought about it was, those things that you laugh at either in a writer's room or at dinner or whatever. And you're like, anyway, let's get back to writing what we're writing. Yeah. We're like, no, let's put that in the show. You know, like that, we, that was sometimes the way we thought of it is don't, don't, don't edit out the, the random dumb stuff. And um, the, uh, the state by state book was interesting for us because as a group, we always mold over every piece of material and voted on everything. And everyone rewrote everybody else's, thing and and it was a lot of calling it out um for the book it, we literally just said Any, everybody write whatever you want and it goes in <laughs> um and so it created this fun freewheeling uh book which i i do think is pretty funny who's the who's the weirdest person you've ran into that you're like you like the state hmm i don't know the only the, the i remember hearing in in secondhand at the same party, Steve Martin saying that he thought the state was funny like uh-huh. years ago in the nineties. And I was just like, ah, 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 ah. Um, but uh, it's not, you know, you meet people in Hollywood all the time. They're like, we're big fans of your stuff. And half the time you find out that they've never even heard, seen anything or heard of it. Oh, so, I did a project for comedy central one time and Jim Sharp was yeah. my producer and we get a break and I'm like, Hey man, I got to geek out to you about the state. And he was like, what? And I was like, I'm like a massive state. Like I, it really was like my show. He was like, Oh God. I, okay. And then he sent me over like a, uh, literally like an anthology of everything you guys ever did. And I was like, Oh my God. Oh wow. Yeah. You guys ended up working with him with Stella, correct? No, with, with fate. No, no, no. But with Stella, when you went back to comedy central, was he still there? Um, you know, I think he might have been, it was in between. I think he had, was there and then he was out and then maybe he came back after we were there. He, I don't, he was, you know who our executive was? Jesse Klein. Oh, really? 
Um, but she was the, she was our day to day, like giving us notes on scripts on Stella. Um, That's a good person to get notes from. Yeah, no, she's incredible. She she was in development at Comedy Central at that time um, before she became superstar of her own. This podcast is brought to you by Four Hems. Four Hems is all about men's wellness. Need help with hair loss, ED, have a cold, interested in mental health, or even COVID nineteen home tests. Hims is here for you. That's right. I said COVID-19 home tests. Uh, listen, a lot of these problems that men go through are not pro- problems they want to share with a doctor. This is a company started by a guy who knew that a lot of our conversations are better had online than in person. 66% of men start losing their hair by the age of 35. I started losing mine when I was 22 and I did something about it. That's the best thing you can do is do something about it. Get in front of it. Don't seem like you're moving ahead in life because your hair, that's how I felt. So I did something about it. Maybe your dad had had hair loss. My dad lost his hair. My dad's dad lost his hair. My mom's dad lost their hair. If you know that's going to happen to you, it is time to do something about it. And there's no better time than right now while you have some. Thanks to science, hair loss can be optional. Hims connects you with FDA-approved products to treat hair loss, and they have thousands, <clears throat> literally thousands of happy customers loving their results. Time at home is an opportunity for self-care. Hims will connect you with licensed medical professionals online to answer your questions for free and see if FDA-approved products will help you treat the hair loss that are right for you. If approved, products are shipped discreetly and directly to your door. And hey, anyone can make claims about treating hair loss. But if you're not happy, after 90 days, just email Hims and they'll send you a refund. Today, Hims is giving you their best offer yet. If you're not happy with the results, like I said, after 90 days, Hims will give you a full refund. And right now, my listeners can get their first visit absolutely for free. Go to 4 slash birdcast. That's 4 slash birdcast. Disclaimer, full refund of price paid for the first 90 days supplies. Refund request must be made between 90 and 100 days after product shipment delivered. Prescription products require an online consultation with a medical professional. We will determine if the prescription is appropriate. Restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. Remember, that's 4 slash podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Fiverr. Look, the way we work together seemingly changed overnight. If there's one thing we've learned, it's having access to the right resources is essential for adapting your business. 2020 has been the year of uncertainty. So how can your business plan for the unexpected? There's so much happening right now. Finding the right talent can be time-consuming, frustrating, and expensive. Fiverr's online marketplace connects business with freelance freelancers offering hundreds of digital services, including graphic design, copywriting, web program, film editing, and so much more. I have had so many hard times finding the right people for the right job. And when you have the right person for the right job, you all of a sudden, the job seems seamless. It gets done so much faster. Whether you're launching your first business, scaling your current business, or in need of extra support to complete a project, Fiverr's global community and network of on-demand freelance talent is here to help. What you are looking for, you find it instantly. It's easy. Customize your search by service, deadline, price, seller reviews, and more. No more guessing games. You know exactly what you're paying for up front. No negotiating needed. 24-7 customer service, a network of quality talent that you can count on. Freelancers have worked with some of the most influential brands in the world. Find the right freelancers that are ready when you are. Fiverr's platform is so flexible. It's enough to accommodate and manage the ebb and flow of business. Check out Fiverr.com and receive 10% off your first order by using my promo code BERTCAST. Find all the digital services you need in one place at Fiverr. That's F-I-V-E-R-R.com. And the code is BERTCAST. Again, that's Fiverr.com. Use the code BERTCAST. How much did how much how much insight how much input did Comedy Central get to have with you guys when you wanted to make Stella on Comedy Central? They gave I mean Jesse got it and gave us some decent notes, but it was basically no. Basically, they were like, "This is what it is. You guys got to just do this or don't do it." <laughs> like it was it was hard to give notes on what we were doing, and and we in fact we thought we would be able to hire other writers, but early in the process, we realized there's no point. We just got to write this thing ourselves and do it our way. And um, yeah, it was a strange show, even though we thought it was much more mainstream than it was. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm very proud of how it came out, but yeah, it was, it was its own singular piece. 
it, it was it was it was so great. Uh, it was so great to see because it still had it had. Well, I don't know. I, the Stella live show was like nothing. I didn't know what stand up was. I'd gone to like a a Holiday Inn and seen stand up in Tallahassee. Yeah, and that, that first live show was like. I mean, it was just, and it was sold out. It was packed. Now, were you talking? Are you talking about? Do you saw a touring show where it was just the three of us? Or I saw it was. I saw you guys. The first comedy show I saw in New York was on. God, I wish I could. It was like on. It, was it a Fez? I said probably. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was a Fez. And it, yeah. by the way, my recollection of sizes of rooms is always inflated. Meaning right. <laughs> now I'd go back to Fez and go, "Oh, well, it's one fifty. But like I remember it being, I was in the far, far back drinking Heineken's standing. Yeah. And I was, and I remember Janine Garofalo went on, and I was such a fucking Janine fan. Those and, were very, very exciting nights. It was all, just for the audience to understand. It was all during the late '90s. We would do a live weekly nightclub comedy show hosted by the three of us, Showalter, Black, and Wayne. And then we had all the best, funny people in New York doing bits, plus a live house band in a sort of fun retro nightclub basement with martinis, and we were all in coat and tie. That's why Stella wears coat and tie because we were like, "This is a dress up night," and um, and it was truly, and it was always packed. And it was like such a charge. It was definitely like a really memorable, exciting moment. That was my first night in New York. That was my very first night in New York. Oh, and wow. Went, oh, wow. yeah. And I oh, was so cool. And it was like, and it, you know, it's like, you know, you can't help it. But those, those first times, those first times are going to always leave a, a mark on you. And I remember, I remember Janine had a joke about, it wasn't even a joke. That's what I loved uh, loved about Janine. It was just her telling a very awkward sexual experience and there was no punchline to it. Yeah. She just moved forward with it. And I went, ah. Oh. And then I remember going and doing, I remember I remember feeling like I was doing my own thing in, at Boston Comedy Club or in the clubs in, in New York and then doing a storytelling show and going, oh, I think I found my voice very early. And, and then it getting shooken out of me like, oh, no, no, that's not what we do here. You can't do that here. And it wasn't, I, I want to say it wasn't until like 15 years later that I really got a voice where I was like, fuck, I don't need to do shit that I think my other people would do. I should just do what I want to do. Isn't that great when that happens? Isn't that a wonderful transition? It is, it is but it's almost like, it's almost like, it's like your mom going, fine. You want to make yourself dinner, make yourself dinner. And you go, well, fuck, it was so much easier when you were showing me how to make dinner. Right. It, you know, there is a, 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 a fear. There, of course there is. But if you just, what I find, I guess I find that you, when you take off those training wheels and you just have to go on your own balance, it's just so thrilling though, too. And you just say, well, I'm gonna, I might fail, I might succeed, but at least I'm just doing my shit, you know? And it's, yeah, but there's, you know, there's, there's you, I would say you, I'm going to say Louis and I, I'm not going to put you and Louis in this. I don't know your relationship with Louis. I know that he's a very volatile guy. I love Louis. Uh, I still I, consider I love him a friend. Um, but one of the things that I love about you and Louis and Mike Liam Black and Michael Showalter and Thomas Lennon and Ben Grant, all you guys is that if you guys have a joke about being on an airplane and you find it funny, you just go with that it's an airplane joke. I get it, but I find it funny. I, this, this, I don't care what, what, like I had a shit joke, uh, in my, that I still to this day is, I really think is very funny just about shitting my pants at Best Buy. And I was like, I can't, I don't want to put that in my special because I, I get, I go, I don't want to just put shit jokes in there, but then, but then I'm doing my new hour and I'm like, this shit joke still fucking makes me laugh. Like it just makes me giggle. And I, and, and, and I, I look at guys like you, you and go, you guys have always had, well, I wish I, I wish I was born with this. Like, Oh, I don't really give a fuck what everyone else is doing. I just want to do my own thing. I really actually want to do my own thing. I don't give a fuck what anyone else is doing. <laughs> to me in the long term, that's the only way to do it. But you know, every, I mean, I, then again, there's a million ways to do it. But for me, if I'm like, if like, if I'm not laughing at it, it does, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I'm an easy laugh though. The, uh, no, how does, so how do you take an idea? And I'll get you out of here soon. I know I don't want to keep you on forever. But yeah, I'm um, very, very busy. How do you how do you get an <laughs> how do you start from an idea, and then at what point do you go pot committed and you go this is my next project, or do you start a bunch of seedlings and kind of move them all up at the same pace and go this one's sprouting better than the other ones? 
the truth is I'm always working on a lot of different things at once, but I don't like that. I, I, I would prefer, and I think it's a bit of a fantasy, especially in today's world, but I, I have this, I always remember reading about Baz Luhrmann. I don't know if it was true or if it's still true that he would come up with an idea for his project, figure it out, write it, prep it, shoot it, do the posts, promote it, release it, take a month long camping trip and then start it again. <laughs> and to me, that sounds kind of awesome. I love, I'm happiest working when I'm working on one thing. Um, but I, I have almost always been working on many things at once because of what you said. You, you, don't, you don't know what things are going to sprout creatively for yourself, nor do you know what the marketplace is going to buy or go for or what the timing might be. And, you, you know, you turn in something to, to somebody who might want to buy it and they might get back to you in two months or you, you just, you never know anything. So it just from a practical career point of view, it's, I, you have to have a lot of irons going, I guess. But, um, and of course, do multiple projects help each other out. You know, you, I'm constantly learning something from one project that I'll apply to another at the same moment. But, um, as I, especially as I get older and as I have kids and blah, 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 I like to uh, unitask more if I can. My, my uh, dream is that, uh, is that uh, it's always been like my, my, in the back of my head, you will uh, develop a project about the pink palace, which is where we met <laughs> and you'll go and you'll go, God, I barely remember that. What was that? I wrote about it. Orzo or the- Uzo, o- 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 Orzo, o- Ozo. Not Orzo. Orzo is like a <laughs> Orzo is a pasta thing. Yeah. Uh, Uzo is it Uzo. Uzo? Oh God, I remember that so well that night. Ugh, gross. That was my second time there. I had already been there and then backpacked through Europe. Ended up at uh, at the Anne Frank Museum with a bunch of guys. We had gone to a. I, I, I'm, I've talked about so much of my life that everything is online. Like everything. Yeah. We went to this flying dildo show in Amsterdam, then went to the Anne Frank house because I didn't, I thought Anne Frank and Helen Keller were the same person. Went to this Anne Frank house con- and Basically then, are. yeah, yeah, <laughs> same story. And so I made these guys laugh and they were like, we will go anywhere in the world with you to laugh like that again. And I, we got on an, a night train from Amsterdam to Barry, Italy, got a, tr- a ferry over to uh, what, the Pink Palace and went for the second time. I had so much God. fun. And the guy, the guy's name's Dr. George was the guy. And it was such a place. I mean, I learned about songs that I just, I would ignore, like Love Cats. Mm-hmm. I remember them playing that over and over again. I like girls who like boys. Like, just like music was a little different then. And right. uh, it was such a neat experience. That what, one I remember, what I remember best about the Pink Palace is it's this hotel that catered to young travelers in Greece. And I remember sitting on the beach at night and next to me was two, a couple fucking on the beach. And on the other side is a woman throwing up. And then everyone is doing some version of either of those everywhere you looked. <laughs> it was kind of yeah. insane. I remember they and said to us, the yeah. first time we went there, they go, um, uh, they, tonight's a toga party. So just go get the sheet off your bed and right. we'll see you guys back. And we went, uh, I mean, it was like, I have such vivid memories of that place. To me, at age 26, I was like, I'm too old for this. <laughs> God, you were 26? Yeah. So That's the only time I've ever been to Greece, actually. So are, you 50, are you 50 right now? 5-0. God damn it. I, thought, older than you, I right? thought you were like 40 back then. Like, I thought all you guys were like <laughs> grown-ups, and I was still in college. Yeah. And you guys were just four, literally seniors when I was a freshman, I guess. Well, that was 96, I think. And so, yeah, we were, we had... Uh, we got going quickly. It was a real lucky start for us. We were doing the state. We were doing, you wrote it, you watch it on MTV as of the group, the state um, right at the moment when half of the group was just graduating NYU. And then, and then right after that, I got back from Europe and I saw in Rolling Stone magazine, uh, you guys were going to Fox. We went to CBS. CB- was it CBS? Yeah. Oh, that makes so much sense why it didn't work now. Now, yeah, yeah. now as a as a college kid, I was like, CBS, that's right. got one of the big three. This is going to be great. I remember where I was when I read the article, and I was like, fuck yeah. I think that was our thought, too, and that was probably what our agents thought, too. And we, we did a, a primetime 
comedy special, The State, on CBS. And believe it or not, didn't work for that audience. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, Favorite Nations? I guess, yeah. We, so was we, it? we owned the um, show and we were like, that's great. We're going to be rich. You know, <laughs> just like, it was uh, the only the only show on TV that entire week that did worse than us was Dweebs, we remember. Um, really? We made this hour-long special, which I thought is really great, but it was not at the right network. Yeah, it wasn't. If, if it was Fox, it maybe would have had a chance. I think we could have. We also should have. We had we had turned down a very nice offer to renew with a raise at MTV, and we were too full of ourselves, and we were just like, "No way, get the fuck out! We're going." To and it was very stupid. We should have stayed. And then was that the end? Uh Basically, well, after this, <clears throat> after that special crashed and burned, we were supposed to do four specials and then end up going up against SNL on, on CBS. That was the plan. After the first special, that all fell in the water. Then we also um, outed this executive in a details article about for being racist um, or saying. Wait, was that, it a details article I read or a Rolling Stone article? Det- uh, well, there was a details article after we did our special about ha- the, do- the making of it. And also, we we quoted the executive at CBS at the time, telling us why we have to a, a, appeal to black audiences because black people don't have jobs and because they don't have attention spans and like all this. It was it was nuts, but and and it was actually when we were in Greece. Now that I remember it, that that whole that that blew up, and then this executive had to like defend himself, and it was this whole thing, and he had to leave or say it was crazy. Really? Um, but anyway, so our whole thing crashed and burned at CBS. And then after that, we, tr- we started working on state movie projects and talking to producers about that. And we did that book project state by state afterwards. And we did a couple other things, but we, and we basically, it, that essentially ended up being the end because then not too long after that, Viva Variety happened and that really broke up the group at the time. Really? Yeah. Um, what was the sketch you did where you threw the, uh, typewriter in the fireplace. Oh, that was called uh, finishing the novel. That was actually something I wrote for the state, but we never made it. And then I did it on the Jason and Randy Sklar show, um, which was called Apartment Two F on MTV, with me and Amanda Peet. Amanda Peet. <laughs> yeah. God, she is a man. Amanda Peet. Holy crap. She's amazing. She is amazing. Beautiful, yeah. gorgeous. I mean, uh, yeah. That's on my website too. I think finishing the novel. If you want to see it. What's your website? It's called davidwayne.com. Oh, I was, well, I was, I was, I remember right when I saw people start doing things on, um, internet on the internet, Wayne days came out. Oh yeah. Who is the co-star? Who's your co-star on Wayne days? I feel like I, she was someone famous. Uh, well, Elizabeth Banks was the first big main one, but then, uh, she, uh, yeah, that, that was a web series where I chronicled all my romantic adventures. Um, uh, it was pretty fun. So tell me about uh, Medical Police. Medical Police uh, is the show on Netflix that we just did, um, which is a spinoff of our, another show, Children's Hospital, we did on Adult Swim. But Medical Police is a big kind of Mission Impossible, James Bond action adventure show starring Rob Hubel and Aaron Hayes, an incredible cast, um, Henry Winkler and Jason Schwartzman and all these uh, uh, and, and it's basically, we shot ha- um, in overseas in Croatia and in LA. And it's a really funny, crazy, just our style of humor, action adventure about a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. so if you want to see a really dumb, stupid comedy about a worldwide pandemic on Netflix, that's uh, really funny. When did, it, when did it come out? January. <laughs> That's like Marin ends, names is special and, and good, good end times or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, fuck the week, the fucking virus hits. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, it's, it's actually maybe cathartic to watch now because it's a fantasy and not to be a spoiler, but they, they solve it. Oh, they do. Yeah. <laughs> They kick it back. Oh, nice. Nice. Were you in the city when everything broke down? Yeah, uh, the, 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 um, COVID. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm in LA. Oh, you're in LA. Yeah. Wait, uh, are you living in LA? 
Yeah, come over. No, I, I think I'm right by you, actually. I saw you jogging one morning, and I, yeah. texted, I texted, texted Mike Lee and Black. I love one of my favorite things to do. Mike Lee and Black and I worked on a project together, and, and I, I, I will say, you know, I, anyone who knows him knows he immediately would go to, oh, we're actually not friends at all. But uh, I would say we're friends, and uh, I text back and forth with them every now and then. But I saw you, and I, was, I had told him about running into you and, and saying, you know, I'd seen you in Greece. And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But you didn't leave a mark for it. He doesn't know who you are. He has no who idea. He'll never know who you are. You understand that? And I went, yeah. So I almost, I texted Michael and back that I saw you and I almost, and he's, you didn't tell him that horrible Greece story, did you? And I, he's, I said, no, I wanted to grab him and go, I'm best friends with Michael and Black. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, yeah. I was in New York for 26 years, but then came out here about eight, seven, eight years ago. Nice. So you're you're out here full time. I think I saw you jogging. Right? You do you jog by your house? Because I think I jog in yeah. the same place. Oh my god! Yeah, let's hang out. I haven't gone out. I haven't gone out out in a while. Have you? Has this leaned in? Do you have OCD? Do you have panic? Does this leaned into that? Are you the the partner who goes? Oh, I'll go to the store. I don't give a fuck. Oh well, I stopped going to the store. Not not that I like. I would do it if I had to, but I feel like you can get everything delivered and. <clears throat> But, uh, no, I basically don't leave the house, <laughs> but I also, I'm fine with that. I'm not like that freaked out about me not having to being able to leave the house, but you know, I'm just freaked out about the world and, you know, no idea what's happening in anything. Um, but that's just the truth. So you just got to go with it. Have you felt I'm more, very I'm more, I'm more upset for my kid. I have two kids and you know, all their summer plans are out the window and all that stuff. And my one's graduating from sixth grade and that's not, not happening. Like, you know, everything's just pulled out from them. And that's what I'm probably most upset about in my own personal world. It bums me out. Uh, my daughter and I were joking about glass half full versus glass half empty. And yeah. so my, my oldest is um, a sophomore and she was saying, uh, we were saying it stinks for all the seniors who don't get a prom don't get to graduate, don't get to walk. And then the first semester of college kind of sucks. And then she said, yeah, but think about all the, all the kids who weren't going to ask, get asked to prom. Now they don't have to worry about that. Like they just prom was canceled. And I was like, Oh yeah, good call. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, every, every, (laughs) there's good and bad in everything, but you know, it's just, I think about how many kids are losing their parents and grandparents. Yeah. So many, it's just, anyway, it's obviously it's awful. Awful, awful. Have you felt creative during this at all? Or do you feel kind of just like, well, what's funny is when it first hit, you know, I had a, like a, you know, a moment of just shock and like, what am, you know, cause don't go in the office. I, I was, I had just finished a pilot, a pilot and now it was like, okay, what's next? What are we going to do? You know, what's going to work on this, 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 and everything shut down. And so I'm like, okay. And then my default was I have extra time. And I just really started making all this music, like so all these dumb covers. And it's been like this fun project that I've spent quite a bit of time on making a bunch of collaborative covers on Instagram. But then, uh, and now I'm starting to sort of, I feel like I'm back kind of doing what I do. I'm developing different projects and, you know, writing things and putting things together, many of which who knows when they would shoot, but that's, I feel like my work life is edging towards normal, even though uh, who knows, you know, my, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't felt very um, creative at all. Uh, And I, I, I actually kind of got a little, the opposite. I felt a little bitter towards creativity because I felt, I felt like the uh, monetization of quarantine was kind of like pushing me back, like going, no, there's, I, I, I don't find it super funny. Like, no, be, I hear you. Because, because of what first responders and, you know, people that are in the medical business are doing and having to deal with and being away from their family, I go, I don't find it terribly fucking hilarious. No, but no. I, I, I do. I feel I have the same thing too, though. I've, I've definitely felt like I don't even want to work or do anything. I don't, yeah, I don't feel super inspired. And also with my kids in the house and just, I've done more cooking and cleaning than I've ever done in my life. And yeah. you know, just a lot to sort of handle on a daily basis. And then just trying to stay sane and keep in touch with people that I don't physically see. And, you know, but uh, 
No, no, but that's where it is. I want to say like, but it'll be over soon, but we don't know. Yeah. I've, I've been doing podcasts. I do one podcast in person with my uh, buddy, a comedian, Tom Segura. We do yeah. one in person together. Um, and then I do one with a comedian, Bill Burr that we've now just do on zoom. And I actually like it better on zoom with him because yeah. we both listen better. I'm a better listener on zoom. Um, and then I, and I moved this one over to zoom and I, I don't mind it. I think I get an opportunity to talk to guys like you, which you may not have the time to shut down for a couple hours and come to my house. But well, Terry, um, uh, Terry Gross always says she much prefer she doesn't want anybody in her studio. You know, I think that's kind of interesting. It is interesting. Did you hear the interview she did with Marin, where Marin interviewed yeah. her? Oh, uh, I, I definitely heard the one she did where um, Ira Glass interviewed her. Oh, I heard Marin interview her, and it was great. I think I might have heard that one too. But yeah, she, she's um, you know a hero. Too. I had Ira Glass come to one of my stand-up shows, and uh, <laughs> it's funny. I, I'm a fan of I'm a I'm I'm a fan of a lot of things. So like I can I get a kick out of a lot of comedy, but a lot of art that I don't make that I like your anything you do or, or or anything the state like it's not what I do personally. I think there's hints of it in places, but I think it's not my style. And, and Ira Glass. Uh, you know, this American life. I love this American life, but people that are fans of this American life probably wouldn't love my stand up. Mm-hmm. But he came to one of my shows and I was like, he's like, I'm so excited. And I was like, Oh, definitely lower ex- your expectation. I was like, he's like, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I don't think you know anything about what I do. And I think you're about to go, why is his shirt off? Like, <laughs> by the way, I love that about, I love that. It's the mo- your best choice. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. That means, that means a great deal to me. Um, uh, well, I do. This has been absolutely awesome. Is there anything I haven't asked you? I feel like, I feel like I've, I've got my list of everything that I would have asked you. And I think I got through all, it all, but is I, there, I, I listen, I I'm happy to talk about anything. I'm, if there's anything that I would, uh, that we haven't mentioned that if people are interested to check out, I would say the, the last movie I made a futile and stupid gesture is a biopic. Oh movie. yeah, that's right. I just talked to, um, I just talked to Rick Glassman. Wasn't he? Oh, yeah. He was incredible. He played Harold Ramis. He looked identical. Let's talk about that for a couple seconds. Sure. Because, um, so tell everyone if they don't know what, you'll probably so, explain uh, it better. Feudal and Stupid Gesture is a biopic uh, that we made, a, a movie about the life of Doug Kenny, who was the founder of the National Lampoon, went on to do Animal House and Caddyshack. And it's sort of an unusual um, uh, way of telling the story about this, this guy who had so much influence on all comedy of today working in the seventies um, and that most people don't even know his name. And so it's a fascinating look at that. And um, it stars Will Forte and an amazing cast with uh, Emmy Rossum and Matt Walsh and Joel Julia and blah, blah, blah. And um, that's what it is. It's on Netflix. And uh, it was a real, it was a departure for me because I was working with a story of real people and it was much more dramatic. It's about comedians, but it's, um, it's also a more of a dramatic biopic about this guy. And and what was did were you were you a big fan of like National Lampoon National Lampoon growing up? I wasn't really in tune with the magazine as a kid. I was more like Mad Magazine um, yeah. was what I understood more. But then I learned to appreciate it so much more once I dug deep and learned about Doug Kenny because uh, I was obsessed with. I mean. Caddyshack and Animal House were oh, oh, the Rosetta oh. Stones of me growing up. And so to know that those two things came from this one brain um, and then to look back and see what it all, you know, the, 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 the National Lampoon magazine at the time was the countercultural comedy. I like that was what it was. It, and then they kind of handed that, um, that baton to SNL along with a lot of the same people. Um, and then to me, I always think of like, there's certain things of a decade, then SNL, maybe that, that, that went to Letterman in the eighties. And then maybe it went to Seinfeld or something in the nineties, you know, or, and then into Tina Fey or who knows, but it really was everything back then. And it was a time when people cared about magazines and it was like, it, it, it was really important and it was it was just a really cool story and it was fun to try to tell a story about that was real in a period and it's portraying people that are still alive. Joel McHale plays Chevy Chase. You know, it's, it's a wild movie. 
did what was your did you get any uh like secret takeaways from caddyshack like i remember the one i learned from watching a documentary was that rodney dangerfield always thought he was bombing because there were no one was laughing and so they right. had him right well rodney dangerfield had no idea what was going on and uh and we tried to show a little snippet of it in our movie but yeah on the set of caddyshack he was completely clueless and his cluelessness was often filmed and used as if it was purposeful. Uh, really? And he, he didn't understand the idea that when you say action, then you talk and then you say the line. And he just thought we're all just like, it was just so funny. He, he really was a little bit out of it. And um, we actually hired a, the only full-time Rodney Dangerfield impersonator to play Rodney Dangerfield in the movie. <laughs> and, um, he also had very limited uh, movie acting experience. And so it was almost a mirror of what happened with Rodney on Kenny. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. If you could draft one comic, one, one of the actors from SNL and shove them into the state. Right. And don't, you can't go, can't go, can't go recent. You got to go like, I'll, t- I'll tell you what, what years you got to do the Sandler spade Farley, rock those years because i think now you look at i think a lot of snl uh, and a lot of the recent past with Kristen wig and and will forte and and i mean i think a lot of those guys had to have looked at you guys as huge influences more so than snl in my opinion well there the the style of comedy on snl is very different than it was back back when i back when you were doing the state Right. Well, clearly SNL now is largely, I think, uh, an outgrowth of UCB and the and the modern groundlings, I guess. And but uh, the answer was UCB around. Was UCB around when you guys were doing the state? No. The, they they well they showed up in New York for the first time when we were doing Luna Lounge right before Stella started. Uh, and so we were doing the alternative comedy rooms and that was, that was, you know, you were saying walking into Stella, your first night in New York for me, walking into the rebar on 16th street and 8th Avenue when they were doing this, this thing called eating it alternative comedy night where comedians could do material that wasn't real material, like, or just tell a story or do something that wouldn't work in a real comedy club or a first draft of something. And I would go, that was my first exposure every on a given night, an average night. It's Mark Marin. Louis C.K., Janine Garofalo, um, and they're just like, I- I'm blown away by these people. I'm like, what is this whole thing? And this whole gallery of people that I was introduced to. And then Stella was an outgrowth of that. I, f- I know you asked a completely different question. but No, no, no. Hey, I, anything you want to say, I want to hear. Um, but uh, so that, 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 that's what turned me on to this whole other idea that you can do something that's not w- what you see on cable on, you know, on, on Comedy Central. And so then UCB k- kind of kicked up. Oh, I had a right. big, yeah. So, so, so w- w- one night at Luna Lounge, I remember so cl- vividly, I was sitting next to this random girl in the audience. And then um, they introduced this comedian that came up and it was, it was Matt Besser. And he started doing this bit about something. I don't remember the whole thing. It's a, probably a famous bit they eventually did. But then he started picking on this woman next to me in the audience and saying like, come on, you know, tell, doing crowd work with her and saying like, you know, what'd you do today? And she's like, I'd rather not talk about it. And he's like, come on, what'd you do today? Like, Could you please? And then finally he gets it out of her. She's like, I had an abortion. And <laughs> the audience is totally freaked out because it feels totally real. And then somebody else in the audience starts talking about something else. And it's all the thing. And then finally the, a voiceover comes on a recorded voice on the thing expressing this comedian's thoughts about what he just said to her, thus revealing that the whole thing is a planted bit. And the woman next to me was Amy Poehler. And like, and I had no idea who nobody had ever met any of these people in New York. This was their introduction to the New York comedy scene. This must probably was in somewhere in the mid nineties when this happened. And then from then on, they were there, they were doing their little shows. They started doing classes. They opened a theater, blah, blah, blah. There became used to be. Wow. Um, yeah. I got a big, I got a big bump when I got into stand up. Uh, I could get up because there was a, there was a, I, I, well, I'm curious if you remember the name of this group. There was a group called the Burt Firstners. Of course. Yeah. And so people well. come up to me and, and just go Burt Kreischer. And I go Kreischer. 
and they go, I, Oh, I, I thought you were someone else. I literally had the same double checking of that today when I was like, who am I talking to? <laughs> the Burt Firstners? Um, making sure that it wasn't the same thing. Because yeah, we knew the Burt Firstners well for some reason. <clears throat> we what crossed paths with them all the time in New York. What were they? Was that an improv group as well? They were an improv sketch sketch group, I think. And they did they were just kind of just like the state. They just didn't have as much going on at but but they were nice guys and yeah. And I think some of them uh probably went on and are still doing stuff. I can't, I have been, I have no memory. Yeah. My memory is shit. So back to my original question. Oh yeah. Who, when you guys were doing the state. Oh, Phil Hartman is my answer. Oh yeah. Oh God. From that era for sure. Yeah. I remember watching SNL with um, Michael Showalter when we were at college at Brown, which was in 1990. And my favorite episode of SNL maybe ever and at that time was when Rob Lowe was hosting and uh, they did one sketch, which was called the Arsenio Beckman show, which was basically, it was basically Rob Lowe playing this character, Arsenio Beckman, who's not Arsenio Holly's Arsenio Beckman. It does it means nothing. <laughs> and he's just basically pretending. And it was just so stupid in the most perfect, perfect, perfect way. And if you ever want to look, look that one up, it's so funny. If you could be, if you could be plugged into any sitcom that you, that this is your, that this is what you'll be doing. It's got to be a sitcom we've all seen or known friends, Seinfeld, uh, guys, men behaving badly, but that's your gig for the next 20 years is you just that sitcom. What sitcom would you do? Taxi. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a great. You forget how fun. I mean, Cheers. Those those lines of Cheers when when Norm walks in. Yeah, those lines were so brilliant that you I go, mean, God. But those taxi lines, yeah, the, yeah taxi th- that genre, Mary Tyler Moore, Taxi, kind of Cheers. Yeah, those those ones where you just you feel the craft of like these are these are artists putting this stuff together in the greatest way on a show, and they those you know. Those weren't six episodes a year like most good sitcoms now. They were doing 25 episodes or whatever they were doing, more, 28 sometimes. It was nuts. Who's someone you'd like to work with that you go, God, I really, I, that person's so talented. I'd love, to, I'd love to do a movie with them, starring them. You know who? Bradley Cooper again. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, because I worked with him, you know, his first job now in two, the year 2000. 20 years ago, but, um, that would excite me. Or, um, uh, I mean, I mean, of course I worked with him again in wet hot first day of camp yeah. in 2015, but, uh, that just came to mind, but there's so many, I, I, I'm a big admirer of so many people that I, that I see. Um, but I also miss so much on TV cause I'm sitting around goofing around. <laughs> what are you, what are you watching online these days? Is there anything that you're deep diving on YouTube? Right now, I'm watching Killing Eve. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think I watch that. And uh, I just get involved with shows, and th- then if even if they don't stay that great, I have to finish them if I like them. <laughs> I watch a lot of Cutthroat Kitchen with my kids. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, I dude, I really sincerely appreciate this. What I mean, a pleasure! What a pleasure! I will, I will not. I will not uh, disconnect you from the guy on the beach anymore. It's okay. It's it's okay. And I'm by the way, it's been kind of fun seeing you every time and always reintroducing myself because I feel like I feel like it's yeah, uh no no no. It's I I was I was in the pool this morning and I was just going through all the like how many times it's happened when Tony worked for you and he was like, I'm working for this guy, David Wayne. And I was so angry because Tony didn't know the state. He had no fucking clue, but right. Tony's so good. He's so good at being Tony that like right. all of a sudden, like he was like, he was like, Oh man, it's the fucking greatest. We're up at camp. We're all up in these campgrounds. I was, I had a drink with Janine the other night and I was like, shut the fuck up. I'm like, these are all my heroes. He's like, yeah, I know. And then we went down and uh, I went and we were with you guys. You guys had, I think, one or maybe a rap party or whatever down kind of edge of Soho right after that. And Tony and Janine and you guys were all at the bar. And I went down with Tony's wife at the time to grab Tony. We were going to go uptown. And you guys were all there. And I was like, God, man, this looks like it was so much fun to shoot. Now in my head, I wish I could go back in time and go, hey, there's Bradley Cooper. Right, <laughs> oh, shit. Right. 
Now I work for Tony. He's produced the pilot that I just did. Yeah. It's so funny. I have to tell you one thing, though, that just reminded me of, which is De- Darren Aronofsky is one of my all-time favorite directors. He's, yeah. I, I've admired him since his very first movie. Like He's been a hero in a way, and I've followed his career. I also ran into him quite a bit in New York during the 90s and, and after, and I never remembered it was him. <laughs> and every time I see him, he would come up to me and say, hey, David. And I'd be like, hey, how are you? Uh, nice to meet you. Like, do I know you? He's like, it's Darren, you idiot. And I'm like, Jesus. Dude, I, I, I'll tell you, this will freak you out. I sat next to you in a hotel, I want to say in like Australia or, uh, or maybe London with your kids. Definitely not either of those with my kids. It, it, was, a, it was a foreign country. Uh-huh. Where, where have you traveled foreign with your kids? Canada, Canada? Costa Rica, and not, that's it. I Hawaii? Think. I don't know. I will. Hawaii. Yeah, I, Hawaii. Sat, I sat next to you and your kids. I've just landed on a flight and I was drunk and I was still drinking and I went down and had breakfast and I was still having a cocktail and you were sitting me ne- next to your kids. And I was like, I'm not going to fucking bother him one more time. <laughs> I was like, I'm not in front of his kids. I can't have his kids realize he doesn't know who I am again. Well, now, can, now can we be friends? De- David, we can definitely be friends. All right. If I see you jogging, I'll say hi. And then it's possible yeah. you live next door to me. I think we do. I think, uh, by the way, I think um, one of those guys from UCB lives right near us too. He's the biggest caps I've ever seen. Yes. Yeah. And we'll so have to discuss this offline. Yep. Um, what uh, do you drink? Uh, yeah. No, not, not, not much. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, there's a, there's a way to answer that that I know. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, well, I appreciate that, man. I'm, I can't wait. I'm going to check out medical police tonight with the girls. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. you'll like it. And the, and kids, my kids love it. So it's good for young, you know, not super young, but it's good for kids. My kids, it's been fun introducing my kids to, to comedy over yeah. the, and Same. like what they get and what they don't get. And like, we just watched, uh, <laughs> we just watched the hangover two, hangover one. And then we watched the hangover two. And there's a scene where Ed Helms's character has sex with a dude, but the dude has sex with him. And my daughters are like, hold on. That's not super funny. That's really sad. And I was like, well, that's the joke is that it's like, right. And they're like, I, I don't know if we understand that. <laughs> I was like, oh, let me show you what hot American summer. <laughs> Did you show them airplane yet? I, oh yeah. I've showed them. We showed them airplane. We've, we've been having a, uh, we showed them Blazing Saddles, which was a misstep. A lot of explaining to do. You're like, whoa, there's a lot of words you're not allowed to use in here. Excuse me while I whip this out. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it's been fun. So we'll watch uh, Medical Police tonight. Awesome. I'm going to text Tony right now and say, I finally met you. <laughs> David, thank you so much for doing this, Great man. This was a blast. It, was, it really was. Uh, stay safe. Take care. I'll talk to you later, buddy. Bye-bye. Thank you.